Hi there, my name is Ashley Booth and I work for the Chinook Regional Library. I would like to begin our presentation by acknowledging that we are on traditional lands. While this program is digital and our speakers and viewers are from near and far, we are hosting this event from the city of Swift Current, which is located on Treaty 4 territory. This is the original lands of the Cree, the Ojibwe, the Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories, and we acknowledge the harms and the mistakes of the past. We are committed to moving forward in partnership and in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today's program will include a few small videos from our partners that helped out put this presentation together and will be followed by our main speaker. During the presentation, there is a chat window available for viewers. Please feel free to submit your questions any time during the presentation. However, our speaker will be addressing them at the end. Good day, I'm Swift Current Mayor Al Bridal, and it's my honor to welcome everyone who is attending the Truth and Reconciliation Speaker Series virtually today. Today's speaker will be Zoe Roy, a poet, community-based educator, community engagement consultant, author, filmmaker, and social entrepreneur based out of Saskatoon. Zoe's distinguished career has seen her receive a number of honors, including the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the National Aboriginal Achievement Award from the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, and the Inspire Award for her innovation approaches to community engagement and education. I'd like to thank Ms. Roy for joining us today, and in addition, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our event partners, SAS Culture, the Chinook School Division, Innovation Credit Union, the Southwest Multicultural Association, the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan, Great Plains College, the Newcomers Welcome Centre, the City of Swift Current, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, the Chinook Regional Library and many other individuals from the community. Thank you for this opportunity to bring greetings on behalf of the City of Swift Current. Please enjoy your day. Hi again, it is me, Ashley, from the Chinook Regional Library, sharing um, some of what our patrons have shared with us about contributing to reconciliation in their own personal lives and in their communities. We had a campaign where people could share with us, and I thought I would share some of the, uh, the answers we got from our community. So we've got Erin in Pontex, who says, Reconciliation to me means bringing the two cultures with such divisive pasts together so we can create a future. Owning our past actions, learning from them, talking about them, working as one common good. And I have Sharon here who says, my children have been learning in school much more than I ever did. I have hope about the future of our society as we talk more, learn more together, heal and grow. I think there's some really interesting themes there. My name is Lisa Kuntz and I'm a retired educator and a proud member of the local Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing the second speaker in our Truth and Reconciliation speaker series, Zoe Roy. Zoe is a Cree Dene Métis woman from the Peter Ballantyne Cree First Nation in Saskatchewan. She is a spoken word poet, MC, educator, filmmaker, author, and PhD scholar based out of Kingston, Ontario. She is currently working on her debut album, Zoetry, set to be released in the fall of 2021. During the day, Zoe runs Zoe Roy Creative Consulting. She has a passion for imagination and spends a lot of time collaborating with kids or making things happen for them. Her Cree Dene Métis roots and a career as an artist have given her a unique insight into working with Indigenous and Canadian youth in pursuit of relationship building and reconciliation. Zoe has worked with the National Arts Centre Music Alive program in Saskatchewan for the past five years and has collaborated with classrooms across the province to produce collective stories. On a local front, she collaborated with students in grades six and seven classrooms in both Maple Creek Composite School and Gull Lake School, as well as adult students at Great Plains College. In addition, we were fortunate to have her participate in our local uh, Truth and Reconciliation Walk held here in Swift Current in May of 2018 and provide a keynote address at the Stop Racism Conference held at Great Plains College in the fall of 2018. Her passion, experience, and knowledge in storytelling, artistic expression, and community engagement 
provide children and youth with a platform to heal holistically and communicate authentically in a safe place. Zoe has received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the National Aboriginal Achievement Award from the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, a Woman of, Day, of the Day Distinction Award in Saskatoon, the 3M National Student Fellowship from the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, and the Inspire Award for her innovative approaches to community engagement and education. She is also the community engagement consultant for Three Things Consulting and a film producer with Soul Data Productions. The Southwest Saskatchewan Truth and Reconciliation Committee is pleased to have Zoe as a part of our speaker series. We are confident that her words today will prove to both inspire and challenge each of us as we continue to share and learn from each other, working towards a shared understanding of our history and striving to create systems that benefit us all. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Zoe Roy. While the reality of our current world today makes getting together a little bit different, we still want to acknowledge the custom of offering tobacco when asking for assistance from an Indigenous elder or knowledge keeper. We have offered tobacco to our elders and knowledge keepers with us in person today and wish to offer this tobacco to Zoe. Zoe, we offer you this tobacco for your presentation for us today and for your assistance for furthering our discussion about reconciliation and sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you so much. And Lisa, thank you for that wonderful introduction to the entire Truth and Reconciliation Committee in Swift Current and surrounding area for your continued dedication towards the movement. I can tell just by working with you over the past few years that I your intentions are actually manifesting into real structural change. And the fact that you are pushing the envelope and creating a speaker series to stay committed to the conversation of reconciliation, to check in, are we really working towards our intention or are we just reproducing the same old, same old? I, I appreciate your mindfulness of reconciliation. I think that is uh, the most important part of this movement. I, I also want to thank the mayor for your kind uh, words, your address uh, this afternoon. And uh, to everyone who is here today, uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to be present. Uh, I'm not sure if you have people around you, but if you don't have people around you, I hope that you can imagine yourself in this space where we are, we are in this together. We are not alone. And if this pandemic taught us anything is that we really do need each other and we really can't do it alone. And that's okay. I think knowing that is a really good place to start. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this speaker series. I am going to share with you uh, some of uh, my own stories, uh, my work in reconciliation, my inspirations, some thoughts and ideas that I have. And uh, I will end this session by talking about some work that still needs to be done. Uh, I, I hear a lot of times people speaking about reconciliation uh, in, in the sense that uh, we have something to reconcile between two distinct groups of people uh, from the past, but you and I both know that that is very untrue, isn't it? You could just look around. You could just look around this Canadian society and it might not surprise you that women, the bearers of our nation, Indigenous women, not only are we most represented in missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, you know, not only did we have to have that inquiry but it might not surprise you that 35% of the people who are homeless in Canada today are Indigenous women. 
it might not surprise you that Indigenous girls are most represented in the youth justice system. And it might not surprise you that uh, Indigenous women um, uh, are overrepresented in prisons, just like Indigenous men are. But the rates of Indigenous women incarceration, the rates of Indigenous girls incarceration is, is not the part that tells the story. And so what I really want to, to ask you to be mindful about is, is the humanity that is necessary to consider when talking about reconciliation. Okay, this is not a problem of the past. This is a matter of settler colonialism. This is ongoing settler activity that marginalizes people, puts them into positions of oppression structurally so that Canada continues to, to thrive, to be prosperous. And, and it's nothing personal, that's the thing. Colonialism, colonization, these are nothing personal. People truly believe that they have the answer for our people. And, and so it might not surprise you that when people believe that they have the answer, then surely women, bearers of nations, could continue to be a threat to Canadian society today. And so I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to be, uh, uh, I'm happy to be Dene. I'm happy to be from the North. I'm happy to be from my land. I'm happy to love my family. I'm happy to know my family. I'm happy to love myself and to know who I am because Throughout this story, not only in my talk, but in a lot of talks that you hear, you know, about this topic, you'll, you'll see that the reclamation of oneself, out, my own peace, my own self-love is actually the, the goal of reconciliation, isn't it? You know, we live in a multicultural society. In Canada, we prize ourselves, we pride ourselves on being multicultural, yeah? Well, when you when you look at Canada and you can see that we are like a cornucopia of culture, if you will, um, you can you can start to imagine, you know, uh, remember perhaps some of your friends, the stories of what they came from. Nobody leaves their homeland because they want to. I want to make that incredibly clear. Nobody leaves their homeland as their first choice. It is usually their last choice. So when we're considering uh, the indigenous population in Canada, you know, so many of us were, you know, we were put onto reserves and then we had to stay on the reserves. And then in 1920, reserve, uh, residential schools became mandatory for, for children to go to. Well, that's actually when Indigenous women started going to the jails, was in 1920 as well. And you guessed it, it's because the women were going to get their children from the residential school. In 1920, that was 100 years ago, uh, two percent of the Canadian popu uh two percent of the Canadian prisons uh were uh, filled with Indigenous women, and nowadays, one hundred years later, uh, Indigenous women represent forty two percent of Canadian prisons. In Saskatchewan, the prison guard is actually the the job that is uh uh it is. Uh, the job that is uh, the fastest growing occupation in, in Saskatchewan. Uh, and, you know, the numbers for women is actually reflected amongst youth as well. Uh, you know, youth could not be considered a criminal until 1984 when they came out with the Young Offenders Act. 
And prior to the Young Offenders Act, youth could only be considered as being in a state of delinquency, according to the Juvenile Delinquence Act from 1907. And so this this law was in place for a very long time. Uh, but when 1984 came and they created the Young Offenders Act, uh, Indigenous people were coming to the city rapidly. And for those who are older, uh, you might remember the discourse in the newspapers being heavily around the Indian problem. Well, in 1984, uh, the Indian problem was the common language, but we've just transferred that language now and we call them indigenous issues. And so by, by you know, framing these as indigenous issues, it, we cannot talk about indigenous issues and reconciliation at the same time. Do you understand that? Because uh, if you were to talk about indigenous issues, you are placing the problem onto the group of people from a deficit-based lens. Whereas when you're talking about reconciliation, you're talking about righting the wrongs of the past, right? You're talking about creating like a, a structurally balanced playing field for all people to thrive. Well, the thing is, is that the residential schools a policy uh, was 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 an act of genocide. It was actually a structure of genocide, uh, protected by Canadian laws, facilitated by uh, the you know the church and and uh, and and the system uh, was was okay to Canadians because Canadians uh, saw Indigenous people as less than right. That hasn't changed very much, but uh, Senator Murray Sinclair last week, he talked about how the Convention of Genocide says that uh, genocide is about forcibly removing children from one race uh, for the purpose of eliminating that race and putting those uh, kids into the care of another race. Well, uh, we do not use residential schools anymore, but I can tell you right now, if Indigenous children were not in the child welfare system, there would be no need for a child welfare system of our caliber. Would we still see child welfare through the same lens if Indigenous children were not synonymous with people who use the child welfare system? Would the youth justice system still use a genocidal tool like the risk risk assessment that uh, that acknowledges being indigenous as a deficit, that acknowledges being in poverty as a deficit? Well, if you start to look at how the system is analyzing and assessing risk, then you can start to see that the same genocidal tools that were used to facilitate the residential schools is actually still being used to facilitate uh, government uh, organizations now. Okay, I'm gonna say organization, I don't think that's the wrong word, governments, okay? The problem here is, is that the it's so much more insidious than that. Uh, the, the, Canadian government, the Dominion of Canada, shares their power with provinces and territories. Provinces and territories uh, have uh, administrative power over how uh, these different uh, these different laws are are played out. For example, the 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 law has the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Well, Saskatchewan has youth probation programs, has the youth criminal justice system, right? So they take care of the courts, they take care of the corrections, they take care of probation, they take care of, of programming, right? But the thing is, is that the Indigenous woman, the bearer of the nation, is left without all of these tools. We know these kids need a safe place to go. We know these kids need to go to school. 
We know these kids need a safe place to go to sleep at night. We know people with trauma are more likely to struggle with addiction. So that the 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 possibility, the likeliness of addiction to be present in in families or within people's lives who have experienced intergenerational trauma, something like the just uh, something like the justice system, the child welfare system, or something like residential schools. Okay, so what I'm really thinking about is that if we're talking about reconciliation, then we need to be considering how we are actually changing the trajectory of the indigenous woman's life. If we are taking away the choice from a mother to, to be able to raise her children, to participate in society, uh, then we are simply going to reproduce the same situation. And it's going to get worse because Indigenous people are the fastest growing people in this country. And when it comes to Saskatchewan, those numbers are even higher. And when I talk about marginalization, you know, uh, so the mother is, the mother is you know, either she's working, uh, she's at home, she's trying to take care of the other needs. She herself needs, you know, she needs a social life. She needs friendship. She needs love. She needs mentorship. She also is a human who is healing. And, and if we continue to help her uh, eliminate the barriers that she has from, from being a mom, then the likeliness of her uh, taking on that role, uh, you know, more like a, you, she would have the luxury of time. She would have the luxury of less stress, you know, things like this. And these are things that a lot of us take for granted. And especially when we come from families that, you know, have like grandparents who take our kids for the weekend or, or people we can depend on if we don't get paid in time, or maybe you have two incomes in your family, uh, or maybe you grew up playing soccer, so it's pretty normal for your kid to want to play soccer. Maybe the likeliness of you going out to play soccer with your kid is probably much more likely than if you were raised you know in a school system or something where you were told that you were not accepted does that make sense so i just don't want to uh suggest for a minute that things are getting better uh because structurally they are actually getting worse uh but culturally i believe they are getting better and culture is actually the most important part because systems will not change until the Canadian population changes. And the way that it, you know, the way Swift Current is going about it, that's, that's a really good way to start. Because when a core group of people care about something, they can look out, they can grab some more people, they can grab more people, then you have a bigger core group of people that care about something, and you're going to look out, build more people. Well, that's a lot of people. Now imagine it's time to come, come to voting season, and you have all of these people with shared values. You can imagine that the government's who are there to, to represent you will actually consider what it is you all are, are, are sharing, right? I, so my work in reconciliation has a lot to do with telling uh, the truth as I see it. I am a scholar, I am a, I'm an artist. And I go by priceless because I was always the girl uh, like the wild child who would just kind of say what everybody was thinking, but was a little too nervous to say, well, I would be the one to say those things. Um, I think it was because I didn't have much to lose at the time. I, I guess like one of the best things I learned 
from poverty, from being at rock bottom at such a young age, is that uh, you can only go up from here. And uh, I think that is an attitude that we should have together is that we can only go up from here. We can only move forward from here. We cannot change what we've done. But what we can do is be very critical of what's going on around us right now. The media, you know, Western society is very media dominant. Don't be fooled of, you know, how many people are deciding what stories to tell you, what stories are important. And, you know, when we're talking about Indigenous stories, there's there's often stories of resistance, there's stories of incarceration, jail, crime, these kind of things. There's stories of, of injustice, there's stories of child welfare, there's stories of um, climate action, there's stories of, uh, of like police disruption, that kind of stuff. They're they're usually they're usually resistance-based stories or about injustice. These are all very colonial-centric stories. Uh, but one thing that is important to know is that we can pick up the system and we can look at it. And we can check it out, see what it's about, but it's not who we are. We have to put it down. We cannot give all of the control to the system because the system is made up of us and we have to decide where we stand in order for us to guide the system in the proper direction because of right, as of right now, it's still super muddled with colonial tactics uh, that, is, that is going to uh, further reproduce the same situation. Sorry to be not all bubbly, but I don't want to come on here and lie to you. I want to be honest. Do you want to hear like some inspirational stuff now? Here are my inspirations. Uh, so... <laughs> Once I decided that I can pick up the system and put it down, then I started like uh, being curious about it. Then I'm not so judgmental about it. I can put it up here and I don't feel lower than the system. I can be curious of the system because that's who I am as a person, right? I am only Indigenous because Canada exists. If Canada wasn't here, I would not be indigenous. I would be a human, right? I am Cree, Nehiao. I am Dene, I am Métis. These all mean that I am a person. I am a human of this land. I feel with my heart and I think with my mind and my inspiration comes from the feelings that I get. This has nothing to do with the system. I don't think about my feelings in the context of being Indigenous. I feel my feelings as a human. And that's why I create poetry. That's why I create music. Creativity allows me to explore and understand what it means to be a good human. And I learn from my elders. I learn from the, the aunties, the people that I look up to. I also work with people uh, to be coached and mentored so that I know that the message that I'm sharing is, is resonating with the elders, the people who came before me. Uh, and that's not an act of resistance. That is an act of love. Now, I want to share with you a music video that we produced. It's called Cook 'em Rap. I'm going to get my friend to cue it up. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, about this music video. Oh, 
That makes me so happy. Okay, so I want to tell you what that song was about. <laughs> so those women, that is my mom, Maxine Roy. That is Rita Bouvier. That is Maria Campbell and Louise Half. So four women who I super look up to. I miss them so much. And I... Uh, they trusted me to uh, to lead them in writing a song together. And as you can see, they killed it. Uh, so, so the first verse is, uh, we can roll our hips and, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, we can swing our hips and roll our joints. We can pucker our lips and make you quisqueo. Quisqueo means go crazy. So what they're saying is that what you think just because we're old, we don't know how to roll your hips. We don't know how to roll our joints. We don't know how to to feel sexy, to be sexy, to make you go crazy. You don't think we know that just because we're old. Uh, the second, the chorus is, um, and that means we are not scared. We are not afraid. Then the second verse goes into, uh, I, you think, um, you think hip hop is the first rebel music? Well, Hank Williams cried, and you weren't supposed to cry as a man back in the day. Oh, and then Elvis Presley, he thrust his hips on the stage. You weren't supposed to do that, and he did that. So now you think you're a rebel because you found out what hip hop is? They're talking to the kids, right? Then they go on to uh, talk to the elders. Elders, grandmas, grandpas, don't you see that your kids are, uh, are, are making music? Actually, this is the last verse. This is Maria's verse. Don't you see that your kids uh, are, are talking to you through their music? Listen to them, stand up with them, dance with them, move your body with them. They're telling you who they are. 
in um, Maxine, her voice, uh, her verse, uh, my mom, uh, she talked about how uh, we never tell you to be quiet because we want to know who you are. There's so many elders or people who talk to us and tell us that hip hop is taking our kids away. Hip hop is bad and stuff like this, but hip hop comes from a place of oppression. Hip hop is about speaking your truth, telling your story, being honest about who you are. And that's what these women were trying to tell the kids. They're trying to tell you that too. Don't think that things are so different today. That might be your ego speaking, but in your heart, you know you're connected to something bigger. There is something much bigger going on, and you are a part of that. And when you know that you are a part of something, even though you can't see it, you can start to believe that you can take more risks. Uh, perhaps you can reach out. Perhaps you can even ask for help because you realize that we are in this together. We are only one person walking around this life. How many messages, how many notifications do you get on your phone a day? How many meetings do you have? How many people do you have around you who have expectations of you? How many things do you have in your mind that are due today or next week or next month? All of these things make us weaker and weaker and weaker. Uh, they make us feel so inundated as if we don't have the capacity to change the world. And so it feels so inundating, like, where do I begin? Well, the truth is, is that you just begin. In, instead of making assumptions, you ask questions. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of where where I'm at. When I was in high school, people it just seemed like people assumed that because I was native that I just came equipped with all of this indigenous knowledge. Well, that's so far from the truth. You have to understand that most indigenous people, even people in the room right there with you in your class, we were raised by the same system as the rest of Canadians. You know, the same five guys who created the Canadian school system that we exist in today created the residential school system as well. This idea of school has, has drastically changed over the years, but this, this notion of, of othering is still structural within the school system that we that we are all a part of today. Uh, and so as an indigenous person, when your knowledge is othered in a classroom uh, and then you're called on to know, but then you don't know, you don't only feel ostracized in your classroom, but you feel ostracized from your own people so, so when we talk about marginalization being structurally facilitated by settler colonial activity, then you can recognize that uh, that uh, reconciliation is just not needed for the past. But reconciliation also means being really critical and mindful about the way that we're running our institutions today. I, <laughs> spoken word, uh, music, uh, this helps me, this helps me be a good human. It helps me understand what my values are. It helps me understand the footing that I have. And it helps me uh, cope and heal from my own turbulence and trauma, uh, you know, from my own life. And uh, I'm going to share one of my newer poems with you. Um, that is really about our uh, reflection. My love waits curiously in the shade beneath the big tree at the playground. It yearns to feel the joy of the last monkey bar, of the fast pursuit to the bottom of the slide, of a new friend to swing with. My heart waits in the tree shadow, fully braced wondering what this is supposed to feel like. 
My love asks my heart, why don't we just go play? Quickly shot back with the tongue snap, my heart reminds my love that we are afraid. If you wanna go so bad, then go and escape. Just know that you are breaking the last promise I told you we made. My love goes back to hide in my heart. My heart holds tight to my love through this guise of keeping it safe. Every breath it expects will erase a little bit of my shame. If I let myself down, at least I know I am to blame. My tears put my flame out again. But this is my safe place. At least these are the narratives that I've replayed. It is not enough to be tamed when my heart is so wild like me. My veins pump this blood so violently. I mistake the dance between the fear of being seen with the need to be free for anxiety. So I make friends with the tree. It's gentle in the way that it speaks. It's a giant like me, but so far from a beast. It doesn't mind my need to breathe. So it lets me lean here and catch my breath. Gives me air and lets me rest. It gives me shade and shares its depth. It makes me know it's trying its best. It calms me down and makes me forget who I am hiding from. It reminds me that it will be here. Even if I want to go out and play, it will see me slide and swing and I can look back and that'll be okay. I can make a friend and that friend will have a name and I can tell the tree all about it when I come back again. My heart has a lot to learn from this tree. Its ability to let me be free without judgment, welcome me back with an invitation to hug. And this is all my love is trying to be. Thank you. So poetry, uh, as you can see, is really important to me. And uh, I think um, if I was to share anything about creativity is that, you know, as a person who grew up with intergenerational trauma, I have to acknowledge the trauma that is in my own heart. Uh, I wear them like glasses. They make me see the world a certain way. I heard an elder say one time, don't get mad at your family for pushing your buttons. They're the ones who created them. And with this, with this knowledge, with this understanding in mind, I, I don't have to take all of my healing on at once. I don't have to, to hide myself uh, because, because I am not perfect. I don't have to be ashamed of my insecurities or a thought that comes to mind that's not mine. I was also raised in a media dominant society. I was also raised and taught by the Canadian public school system. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what it means to be indigenous but I do know what it means to be Zoe. And in order to get to Zoe, I have to be okay with creativity. I have to let myself create because the only way that I can get over my criticism, my judgments about how I'm supposed to be in the world is by listening to who I actually am by creating. And that's, that's really important to me. I want to share a, a song with you. Uh, I hope it works. I'm just going to play the beat. Can you hear it? 
Oh goodness, I hope you can hear it. And she knows. And she knows. And she knows. You kept the code to the heart of gold, gave want to those stuck in the cold. Instead of going astray, you can't astray. Who needed love, you'd let them know. It's okay, it'll be all right. You're safe now when you're in my side. Yeah, tell them how it goes. And she knows, 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 and she knows. Tell them how it goes. I can't believe in this all the times we played together through all your life. Right from the day you could take a step, you made it known that you're the best. I can't deny our bond is strong. Ever since you were small, you come along. I take you everywhere so you can hear what they have to share. As you grew each year, so did my fears. I saw the storm coming near. I saw the truth and the lies. I knew we'd find a way to be all right. You became my teacher, you grew so wise. Never let them in the way of a life you like. Whenever you say that it's time to rise, you're the one to a feet and about the grind. You say within your life, persevere, sacrifice. You are my sunshine, the brightest star in the darkest nights. Dream girl, the world is yours. All you need is all that's served. Keep that glow. And he knows. You stay within your life, persevere, sacrifice. You are my sunshine, the brightest star in the darkest nights. Dream the world is yours. All you need is all that's served. Keep that glow. You kept the code to the heart of gold, gave warmth to those stuck in the cold. Instead of going astray, you found astray. Who needed love, you'd let them know. It's okay, it'll be all right. You're safe now when you're in my side. Yeah, tell them how it goes. And she knows, 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 and she knows. Tell them how it goes. <laughs> Okay, so that's one of my songs, and um, I just need a little time check. Uh, I think I have uh, three more minutes, so I, I guess what I really want to share with you is, is that uh, Indigenous women and girls need your help. Uh, we, we don't need your help. We, we need your compassion. We need your love. We need you to help eliminate barriers women have from caring for our own children, caring for our own nations. And you might not have a, a, a great relationship with, with, uh, with particular indigenous women in your life, but if you look around you, you can find organizations, places to help focus on finding uh, creative ways to eliminate barriers by making connections. You know we're the epitome of our relationships. You know you needed people there for you when this pandemic went down. You know what it's like to struggle. You know what it's like to feel isolated. You know what it's like to feel alone, to feel like you don't have help, to feel like you don't have it together. These are all common human emotions. It is not, it does not make people weak that they are, that they are uh, unable to meet all of the expectations of today's society. When we talk about marginalization, the two main factors that are at play are the Canadian institutions, the child welfare system, the Canadian education system, all across the board. And we're talking about the justice system. These are the institutions that are on the other side of the market. We are in a globalized economy. Canada is not a sovereign nation. You saw that. We didn't even have enough toilet paper. We depend on other markets all around the world. We depend on relationships with, uh, with uh, countries all over the world. Canada is its own country, but it's very dependent on the, on the global market. So when we talk about poverty, when we talk about marginalization, well, what is the incentive 
of the Canadian government to eliminate the the racist policies or or eliminate uh you know these assessments that uh that uh, prescribe deficits to to people without power, particularly Indigenous women. I I want to to really be mindful of uh you know how we're uh, giving people opportunities, eliminating barriers by giving people opportunities to have jobs. Also, uh, not everybody wants to be helped. Just because people are in poverty. Like, when I was in poverty, I didn't know I was in poverty. I still needed to be invited. I still wanted to go and help out anywhere I possibly could. No matter how you view somebody, even if you view them as in need, rethink why you view them like that and, and try to understand that they too have something to offer the world. Being a good neighbor is about being mindful. Being a good relative is about being aware using your privilege, your platform as a responsibility, taking on that responsibility and asking for help when you don't know the answers, saying your story when you make a mistake. We're all just little too, and we're all just in it together. And every little step forward counts. Every thought, every like little racist thought that you have, forgive yourself let it go that is not who you are that is what you were taught and not everything you were taught is good that doesn't make you bad so you can forgive yourself let it go challenge yourself to rise to the occasion and and advocate when you can even if you're advocating against yourself your own thoughts and stuff like that I only came here with uh, the ideas and um, the thoughts and idea uh, attitudes and you know I guess stories that 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 I had in my heart at the time today. I I was hoping that I can give you something um, real because reconciliation is so meta. It's so ambiguous. It's so vague. Like, what are we even supposed to do with a big word like that? Who even says that word? We don't talk like that. So what do we actually mean? We want to be a, we want to be a good human. We want to have a good life. We want to be a good neighbor. We want to be a good relative. Maybe you're even going to consider what kind of ancestor you're going to be. I'm not sure where you're at, but I hope that you're inspired to uh, accept yourself for who you are, accept that collectively we still have a lot of work to do, and accept that you're enough to be a part of the movement. And I think that's all the things I have for you today. Oh, sweet, and I'm right on time. So if anyone has any questions, I'm not sure how this is gonna go. Oh, we have questions. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, I didn't even notice there was comments. Okay. Question from the audience. What specific changes would you like to address? Okay. So, according to the, like, the criminal justice system, as we see it right now, um, so 46% uh, indigenous youth represent 46% uh, of the total indigenous youth uh, population who is in, uh, involved in correctional services. That's what they call it. And uh, okay, so the thing is, is that there's something at play right now called the risk need responsivity model. This, I believe, is a genocidal tool. Uh, you know, the circumstances for Indigenous youth today are, are incredibly bad because uh, it because you don't see it. Um, it's almost like we just don't give youth any opportunities. 
wait for them to become addicted to something so we can criminalize them. So we're looking for opportunities for kids, particularly around the ages of zero to 14, that are creative in nature, that, they, that kids have a safe place to go to in addition to their home. I think that's what we need for youth, children, to prevent them from getting in the justice system. But when it comes to the actual youth justice system, uh, like it's 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 built with the with the risk assessment. Look up the R and R assessment, and uh, I have some research that's coming out right away. Like uh, I'm I'm pretty active in this, so so to tell you simple things you can do, it's not that simple. It's very ominous. You can't really see it, so you have to. Uh, try to create opportunities for young people to have options, places to go to. Because one one kid told me one time, people don't go around, uh, people who know their love don't go around breaking other people's stuff. Now, that doesn't mean the mom didn't love the kid. That mom just had so many other kid or so many other things on her plate you can't just expect her to do it all. And so that's what I'm proposing. Another question, much of what we do in libraries is meant down to break down barriers and support and lift up our communities. How can we further lift up youth and women and girls, especially in urban centers? Okay, well, one thing that I like to do is you can ask the youth to come up with uh, ideas of what they would like to see in their community. Um, I usually run it like a dragon's den kind of thing. I like, you know, what is your idea? When will it take place? Where will it take place? What impact will you have? What's your timeline? What's your budget? I mean, we live in a market-based economy. Like that's the world today. So if 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 we're going to get them engaged like I would I would like them to be decision makers and figuring out what their programming looks like and then the adults just support them by eliminating any logistical barriers right like they need sandwiches for tonight's youth group so you just help them go get sandwiches right you know stuff like that um and in terms of women and girls I would also encourage you to to bring a like a, a support group together, something that is community based for women uh, to come out to. And if they want to bring their nieces or their daughters or stuff like that. But I would just start off with a small group of people and also assess the community, assess the challenges that we're facing. Uh, they can also look outwards. Their different vantage points will will benefit the the conversation and that uh, you can start to have some some practical changes in place uh in the meantime and that can that can grow into a structural change later on uh i think that's quite important and something you can get going right away even on zoom what organizations should we support when it comes to the rights of indigenous people <sighs> to the rights of indigenous people. Every organization in Canada is a colonial organization. Uh, the overall structure is, is, is built, uh, is built to, uh, to make Canada grow. That's why I say colonialism isn't personal. Um, in terms of you organizations, I would, I would like on the rights of indigenous people. That's the thing, Kay. Like when indigenous people move to the city, it's easier to liquidate us into colonial systems, right? I. Uh, so I mean, I would say indigenous arts organizations. I think 
promoting narrative sovereignty in this day and age is probably the most important part. I, uh, in terms of in like indigenous rights, indigenous rights are being like uh, violated in so many ways. I'm really keen on supporting children and youth, to be honest. Like, yeah, find youth organizations and women organizations to support uh, because they can uh, they can make sure that it's practically applied in a in a timely fashion. Another question from our audience, can we truly have reconciliation if we still give validity to the institutions? OK, so that is the biggest problem at play. The thing is, is that institutions are seeking to indigenize themselves. Universities and schools are not the first to indigenize themselves. You know what? Actually, jails started indigenizing their institutions first. They used they used our um, our culture and and practices against us and they institutionalized them so now the only way that most of us have access to culture is when we go into these institutions so uh institutions are becoming indigenized but indigenous people are becoming institutionalized now if that isn't colonialism then what is so so if that's the game that we're playing, like, I just think that we don't have to have a homogenous society. We, we don't have to all be the same. We, we can have options that are not othered, but right now they are still othered. So maybe it is worth just going gorilla, going off the beaten path to create something that works for you. Uh, I would encourage you to pick up the institution and put it down like, you, like I was talking about the system. Use it to your advantage, but don't get caught up in it. Don't let it define your identity. We have like, you know, affirmative action where like lots of indigenous um, and like people of color, like different scholars are, are, are going into institutions where old white men who have been uh, professors at these universities for a long time, they're having huge identity crises because who are you if like you're not a professor, if you're not a doctor, what have you, right? We've depended on these institutions so long um, and we've prescribed them to our identity and this has become who we are. And that's how we ourselves become the institutions. So I would just encourage you to, uh, to pick it up and put it down and don't give yourself too much to it uh, because it's not gonna give too much to you. Well, that wasn't a very enlightening way to end. Here, I'm going to show you a poem and then we're going to end with this. <laughs> we are the wonders of the world. Whatever it takes, we'll make it work. We are caretakers of the earth. We're warriors for all people, defenders of all that's life. We will not be pushed aside. Women are transcenders of greatness. We're sacred. Women are patient. Sometimes some of us are late, but we more than make it. Women are valued to be valued because we're valuable. Women are the foundation. Listen, we're not malleable. Women have character and we come in all shapes and sizes. Women are resilient. We persevere, rain or shine. Women endure struggle and at most times it's silent.
but women are courageous. Yes, women give me guidance. Women are leaders. We're multi-talented, complex. Yes, women are the boss without having to flex. Yes, women are storytellers, story keepers, teachers. Women are community builders, insightful believers, catalysts. You are all my sisters. Women are an inspiration. Women are life givers, a majestic yet perfected creation. Women are elevating and we elevate each other. Yeah, we're independent, but we still need our brothers. Women are powerful, but we carry a voice. And we'll hold our position till it's time to make noise, cause we are the wonders of the world. That is my time. I am definitely over. I'm okay with that. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. And I hope you got something meaningful from it. Until next time, see you later. Hello, I'm Mary Jane Benish, and I'm a student advisor at Great Plains College, as well as a member of our local Truth and Reconciliation Committee. On behalf of our committee, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has attended and participated in our local Truth and Reconciliation event today, and in particular, today's guest speaker, Zoe Roy. I'd also like to thank our Truth and Reconciliation Committee for hosting these series of events, which raise awareness and allow us to collectively take steps towards reconciliation. In addition, I'd like to thank Derek and Caitlin Newstater from the Landing Studio for making the presentations as seamless as possible. In closing, I'd like to thank our event sponsors, SAS Culture, the Chinook School Division, Innovation Credit Union, the Southwest Multicultural Association, the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan, Great Plains College, the Newcomer Welcome Center, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, the Chinook Regional Library, the City of Swift Current, and many other individuals from our community. Thank you all for your support. On behalf of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, thank you all for participating. <laughs>